Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of life. We thank you for an opportunity to come together and study your word. As we take up this study, we ask that you grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit, um, that you would watch over this message as it goes out um, to wherever it ends up, that you would bless it, bless those that hear it with understanding. We want the latter rain, so we ask that you'd pour it out upon us, and we want to understand uh, the advancing light of the third angel and ask that you would help us to do this very thing in Jesus name. Amen. Some of the notes, some of the passages in this note I just cut out of the last set of notes because I wanted to spend a little bit more time on them but we'll get beyond them. Um, on the top of your notes on page one um, Brother Gee in Texas sent this in that should be on that list, um, but I was unaware of it. Pangaea. The word is derived from Pan and Gaia, which means Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. The name Pangaea is derived from ancient Greek Pan, all, entire, whole, and Gaia, Mother Earth, land. So, also, one of these words that would be up here would be Pan, Pangaea, I guess is how you'd say it. Um, so, all I'm doing is putting that back in the record from the last presentation. But I'm going to take this out of the way here. In the notes last time, we, we, I might have just referred briefly to the threefold union. I want to make sure that we are settled into the threefold union. This was, it's important in prophecy to see. It is the, the structure of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, these three powers. But also, it was one of the purposeful attacks by p and to try to destroy this understanding, so you know it's important. So from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 451, <clears throat> By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp, the ha clasp hands with spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then... And this is one of the places where Sister White, one of the passages where Sister White uses this, she may not have known that she was using it, but she uses this prophetic key, the when, then, you can count three or four whens, and then in the last part she says, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. So from here you can see at the Sunday Law, the threefold union comes together, and not until the Sunday Law does Satan do his marvelous work. And this is an agreement with Revelation 13. In verse 11, the United States speaks as a dragon, and Sister White says, the speaking of a nation is an action of its legislative and judicial authorities. They speak as a dragon at the Sunday Law in verse 11. And then in verse 13, Satan's calling fire down out of heaven. So he, he does his marvelous work after the Sunday Law. Um, the... Another quote, Great Controversy 588, to support this. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Okay, so Sunday Law, threefold union, then the marvelous working of Satan, then persecution follows. The next one is another passage about the threefold union, but it, it, it identifies Satan more directly as not just this, not the, the dragon power in this threefold union isn't, isn't just the symbol of the dragon, it's Satan himself. And you need to see that to understand that Satan is actually going to return and personate Christ. He's going to be here where we can see him with our eyes. And this is one of the passages that allows that to be put in place. This is Manuscript Releases, Volume 14, 162. 
Satan will work the miracles to deceive those. Satan will work the miracles to deceive those who dwell upon the earth. Spiritualism will do its work by causing the dead to be personated. Those religious bodies who refuse to hear God's message of warning will be under strong deception and will unite with the civil power to persecute the saints. The Protestant churches will unite with the papal power in persecuting the commandment-keeping people of God. And as I'm reading this, I forgot one thing. I just remembered one thing I forgot. Um, I'll throw it in here. It, it, this is, it's this thought that's in these paragraphs that I'm in the process of reading that popped this back in my mind. A sister up in Michigan, um, Charlene, sent in three or four uh, passages that she's pasted from news sources and uh, three or four different news sources, different stories, but all telling the same thing um, around the country right now. Um, and I meant it. I meant to put it in in connection right here. I'll try to remember to bring that tomorrow. It's about the the activities in the United States where there are movements afoot to defeat the the COVID-19 pandemic by voluntarily shutting down everything on Sunday. And it's in connection with, with the churches. And the, it, it, you, could, you could see it's right in line with this, that this pandemic is opening the logic to say, well, you know, if we're supposed to self-isolate for two weeks, why don't we just throw in the mix that nothing is open at all on Sunday. So there's no excuse to be out of your house at all on Sunday. And it's all in the, on the, in the context of Sunday. It was interesting stuff. And it's popping up all over now. Um, anyway. The Protestant churches will unite with the papal power in persecuting the commandment-keeping people of God. This is that power which constitutes the great system of persecution which will exercise spiritual tyranny over the consciences of men. And... The great system of persecution is threefold there. It's spiritualism at the top that's going to be personating the dead, and then the Protestant churches and the papal power. Okay, that's the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. Next paragraph. He had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. There's your Sunday law, Revelation 13 11. Though professing to be followers of the Lamb of God, men become imbued with the spirit of the dragon. They profess to be meek and humble, but they speak and legislate with the spirit of Satan, showing by their actions that they are the opposite of what they profess to be. This lamb-like power unites with the dragon in making war upon those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And Satan, now she's not saying the dragon, she's, she's being specific. And Satan unites with Protestants and Papists, acting in consort with them as the God of this world. He's going to personate Christ and identify himself as God in his personation. So he's acting in consort with them as the God of this world, dictating to men as if they were the subjects of his kingdom. He's actually here. He's, he's telling them, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. Dictating to men as if they were the subjects of his kingdom to be handled and governed and controlled as he pleases. This is Satan. Okay, this isn't just, uh, you know, like Protestantism is, is a symbol of all the Protestant churches and therefore spiritualism is a symbol of all the New Age religions. This is the person, Satan. It, it reminds me on the smaller scale of what Parminder is doing with his um, minions because he wanted to control every aspect of everything and he was dictating what they were allowed to do and what they weren't allowed to do. It, uh, okay. it, it was in a smaller scale the same, but it's being led by the same spirit too. Mm -hmm. If men will not agree to trample underfoot the commandments of God, the spirit of the dragon is revealed. They are imprisoned, brought before councils, and fined. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Thus Satan usurps the prerogatives of jo Jehovah. The man of sin sits in the seat of God, proclaiming himself to be God and acting above God. 
I've used this quote for years, and one of the things that I use it to try to show, and I have a series of other quotes that I put with it, and I don't have those other quotes with this because I'm not trying to prove this particular point at this point in time. But I go through and show that Sister White will call the Pope of Rome the Antichrist, but she also will call Satan the Antichrist. They're interchangeable. And I, sh and, and I bring in the quotes where she says the Pope of Rome is the representative of Satan upon earth. So they're interchangeable. But the point being here, the, in this last sentence, the man of sin that's sitting in the temple of God here is not the Pope of Rome. This is Satan. Okay, now you, in the study we're doing, you need to understand that. In the, in the context of Fatima. The prophecies of Fatima are what have prepared the Catholic Church to be willing to allow this being that comes and personates Christ to take control of their church and turn it over, turn, it, turn the leadership of their church over to him. That's why in a previous presentation we read a quote that says, it being the last set of notes we could dig it out, that Satan's building the Catholic Church, it doesn't say it that way, is the, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne of the earth. But it's in the context of raising up the Catholic Church, because he intends to rule the world from the throne of Peter. Okay, but I, I want us to see the threefold union is at the Sunday Law, um, because we're going to start looking at some things connected with the Sunday Law. Yesterday we pointed to the fact that there's going to be dictatorship. Okay, we have this quote from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. Um, Our land is in jeopardy. The time is drawing on when the, its legislators shall so abjure the principles of Protestantism as to give countenance to Romish apostasy. The people for whom God has so marvelously wrought, strengthening them to throw off the galling yoke of popery, will by a national act give vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome and thus arouse the tyranny which only waits for a touch to start again into cruelty and despotism. With rapid steps, we're already approaching this period. We've got the def definition of despotism, despotism or a despot there. It's what we would call martial law uh, or dictatorship. And what, the reason we were referring to this <clears throat> in our presentation on Paneum is because we have predicted this is going to, based upon the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, this is going to take place in the United States. But now with this pandemic, you can see the harbingers, if, you, if that's the right word to use, you can see the typification of the dictatorship that's coming because of this pandemic. I mean, just what we were talking about before we got started, that they're, they're taking control of, the, of the, how you can go into stores now. You know, they're... they're really micromanaging things. Um, and there's a, there is a, a legitimate logic to justify it. So the, the masses are all saying amen. Um, they're not thinking about a dictator at this point. So all I'm saying is the paneum that was ushered in on February 5th of this year uh, is typifying the paneum of the midnight cry and that's where the, the genuine martial law will be put in place. Even though this is, this is getting pretty close, right? Um, shutting down which countries you can go to and... Even, uh, even between states. Between states. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. In Arkansas, the governor has... I forget exactly what the deal is, but I, I know in, in Arkansas, I think maybe Friday or just recently, the governor of Arkansas has restricted travel into Arkansas. I forget exactly what the stipulations are. Probably from Louisiana, mm -hmm. from the states that are really hotbeds, probably, I don't know. Okay, temporal prosperity, we looked at this yesterday, um, or referred to at least, Great Controversy 590. And then the great deceiver will permit, persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. Um, Sister White uses what biblical figure to illustrate? Th th I can think of two of them. There's probably several, but two biblical figures that illustrate this perpetual reproof to dis transgressors. Uh, uh, Elijah and Ahab. 
Okay, their confrontation, are you he that troubleth Israel? But there's one other guy, and he has a niece that's a big player in Bible prophecy. Mordecai. Mordecai. Mordecai, oh, yeah. Mordecai used to drive Haman up a wall. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and she uses both of those stories to speak to this very issue. Um, that's what we become. We become the thorn in their flesh. We're going to get blamed for all of this that's going on. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced, and that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Uh, this paneum here that began on February 5th, they're thinking 40% of the workforce is going to get, go on unemployment. <clears throat> That's a pretty big bite out of a, a, an economy. It's, a, it's just where the temporal prosperity is being removed from the United States right now. Okay, it has been for the last couple of weeks. 23% unemployment during the Great Depression. In the Great Depression, it was 23%. So but, but over the past two weeks, they, they, went, they were guessing 25%, and then they said 30 and the last I heard was 42%. This doesn't mean they're, they're finished with their calculations. It may go beyond that. Um, okay, one of the things that we didn't have in play, that we didn't mention yesterday, but we're familiar with, is the Civil War. Okay? In India, China, Russia, and the cities of America, thousands of men and women are dying of star starvation. The moneyed men, because they have the power, control the market. They purchase at low rates all they can obtain, and they sell at greatly increased prices. This means starvation to the poorer classes and will result in a civil war. There will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And then she quotes from Daniel 12. Okay, civil war. One thing couple of things here when it says the moneyed men because they have the power to control the market and we know that today that is the globalists right right okay another thing too that I was reminded of yesterday by a news article I don't even remember the news article but it reminded me of a statement that we haven't brought up late lately and that is about what sister white says about the the trade unions that they would play a big part in bringing on the Sunday law. So I'm, my mind went back to that yesterday, wondering how that's going to play out. Yeah, that's not a minor theme. I have a, a compilation where they have a, a, a pamphlet. It's many pages of her comments on uh, trade unions and why we're not supposed to be involved and the role they're going to play at the end of the world, for sure. Um, Civil War. Okay, so all I did, I just did a quick Google search this morning. I could have did it, I found one and I said, no, I'll look, and I, I found the second one and I said, no, I, I, I won't go. What, what I typed in in my Google search was something like ammunition. So the first thing that came up, it took me to some newspaper, you know, like in Illinois, and then the next one, I, I wasn't saying what I wanted to, it was saying what I wanted to say, but I was looking for something more a broader comment on the United States and the next place took me to Wisconsin. So this is just, this is happening in the United States. This is about Wisconsin and this is how it reads. But you could type it in on Google and find it out for yourself. COVID-19 has caused people to wipe shore shelf shelves clear of toilet paper, hand sanitizer, non-perishables, perishables, and now ammunition. Jesse Cartwright owns Cartwright's Gun and Ammo in Dodgeville, that's is Wisconsin. He said in the last few weeks he sold out of inventory three times. I went from about 10 customers a week to about 20 customers an hour uh, in some cases, especially on Fridays and Saturdays. While many businesses are struggling to stay open during the pandemic, gun retailers like Cartwright Cartwright are seeing record sales, but Cartwright says he's winning and losing the economic battle. My gun shop is directly next door to my sign shop, and my sign shop is closed down. Cartwright said he feels fortunate to have both 
as essential and non-essential businesses during these times. While his sign shop isn't bringing him any income, his gun shop is doing better than ever. Okay, so the, there's going to be a civil war, and the people that are going to be playing a part in the civil war, they're stockpiling guns and ammunition. And the United States already had all the guns and ammunition they needed to have a civil war. They've done this before. I don't remember the reason why they were clearing out the guns and the ammunition. But it was, every it time, every time there's a mass shooting, and then they start talking in yeah. Congress about taking away oh, people's yeah. guns, then they have yeah, a run yeah. on the ammunition mm -hmm. shops, the gun the, shops. The biggest seller of guns and ammunition in the history of the United States was the term that Barack Obama was in. And that's been proven, is that when he was in, that's when they were buying the most Yeah, guns all and of his emphasis on... Because he wanted to take, yeah. take them away. Okay, so, so it's happening, okay. all right? The, and that would, that would contribute to the backdrop for a civil war. And now I want to get on the focus of this presentation, which is the French Revolution. Okay, which... Could you call the French Revolution a civil war? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. This is Education 227 to 28. With such teaching given at the very outset of life when impulse is strongest and the demand for self-restraint and purity is most urgent, where are the safeguards of virtue? What is, the, what is to prevent the world from becoming a second Sodom? At the same time, anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law, not only divine but human. The centralizing of wealth and power do we see the centralizing of wealth and power with, you know, Amazon and Google and these guys <laughs> that, yeah. uh, uh, anyway, the vast combinations for the enriching of a few at the expense of many, the combination of the poorer classes for the defense of their interests and claims, the spirit of unrest, of right and bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings. What's dissemination mean? Mm -hmm means spread. to spread, okay? So the worldwide spreading of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution. What, what worldwide entity, is there a worldwide entity that disseminates the same philosophy of the French Revolution? The well, the papacy may be behind it, but the liberal press on planet Earth, this is their philosophy, is the philosophy that led to the French Revolution. Um, all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. So, I'm, what I'm saying is, and we understand this in Adventism, and in this movement we understand it well, the French Revolution is an illustration of the end of the world, and I want to look at that now in terms of the King of the South. Um, prophetically, I asked a question here in the past couple presentations, and it was answered how I understand it. I'll ask it again. When, as a prophetic symbol, does the dragon become the king of the south? I mean, there's been king of the south throughout sacred history, but as a prophetic symbol of the dragon, when do we mark 1798? Okay, in 1798, um, and who do we identify as the king of the south at that time period? France. France. Atheistic France. Okay, so when was the French Revolution? 1790s. Uh, okay, it's right underneath yeah, that quote. It's a seven, they, the historians will tell you it's 1789 to 1799. Ten years. Okay, ten being a test. Um, so th this is just a, a Google comment on the French Revolution about that history. The French Revolution was a period of far-reaching social and political upheaval in France and its colonies beginning in 1789 and ending in 1799. The revolution overthrew the monarchy, established a republic, cat catalyzed violent periods of political turmoil, and finally culminated in the dictatorship under Napoleon, who brought many of its principles to areas he conquered in Western Europe and beyond. Inspired by liberal and radical ideas, the revolution made a profound impression. Inspired by the philosophy of CNN, yes. okay, if, if you want to put it in the, the here and now, 
triggering the, triggering the global decline of absolute monarchies while replacing them with republics and liberal democracies. Through the Revolutionary Wars, it unleashed a wave of global conflicts that extended from the Caribbean to the Middle East. Historians widely regard the revolution as one of the most important events in human history. The revolution that begins in France, it sweeps across Europe. It just continues. You talk about the French Revolution during this 10-year time period. And what I'm sure everything they said in here is correct, but they left one thing out, okay, that is more correct. They, they talk about the French Revolution taking down the monarchies, the monarchy of France and the monarchies of Europe, which it did. But what else did it take down? Catholic Church, and, they, and they, they didn't mention this in this overview, but we did, so we put it in the record. And they form republics or democracy. And the point is, the paper that I handed out last week shows the, the prophetic parallels of France and the United States, some of them. Okay, so let's, and they're common in this movement, we understand this. Um, all the two-horned powers in scriptures are pointing to the United States. The United States is the two-horned power, two power at the end of the world. France was a two-horned power. So at that level, France, whose two horns, I'm, I'm calling them horns, the two nations that make up France was Egypt and Sodom, according to Revelation 11. That's its two horns, typifying republicanism and Protestantism in the United States. Ancient Israel was a two-horned power. Uh, the northern tribe of Israel and the southern tribe of Judah. The Medes and the Persians were a two-horned power. Um, so, in Bible prophecy, when you see two-horned powers, they're, they're typifying the United States because that is the two-horned power at the end of the world. It's the one they're all pointing forward to. That's one connection between the United States and France, prophetically. Another one of, of them is, is that we know historically France is who placed the papacy on the throne of the earth, and France is who took the papacy off the throne of the earth in 1798, and we understand the United States at the Sunday Law is going to place the papacy on the throne of the earth, but the United States at that point in time is going to become the leader of the Ten Kings, and ultimately the Ten Kings are going to burn the papacy with fire. So just as France put the papacy on the throne and took her off the throne, the United States is going to put her on the throne at the end and take her off. So France typifies the United States and France introduces into prophecy the subject of the King of the South and the revolution is about a, a change in, in government, I guess is the way to say it. Um, so let, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up here on the board in a minute and start pulling some of these thoughts together, but let me just read this next quote where it says, Slavery Revived. Spalding McGann, page 21. Slavery, slavery will again be revived in the southern states, for the spirit of slavery still lives. Therefore, it will not do for those who labor among the colored people to preach the truth as boldly and openly as they would be free to do in other places. Even Christ closed his lessons in figures and parables to avoid the opposition of the Pharisees. So we know that slavery gets revived at some point in time. And you can argue now that slavery is already in the world. There's human trafficking is, a, is one of the things that Trump wants to put the wall up and from Mexico to, to slow down human trafficking. There's human trafficking in Asia, all, all around the world. You can argue that people are in economic slavery, like in China. I forget the name for the Muslims in China. Anyone know the name of them? There's a, their, their Muslim religion in China has a name. And the, the Chinese government uses them as slaves. Uh, Recently, they're talking about getting these factories up and running that they shut down because of the pandemic, and they bring these Muslim slaves into these factories to get them up and running. They use them as slaves. So slavery is already in the world, and we know it's going to be come into the world again based upon this. So I'm saying that even though it is here, there is a specific point in time 
prophetically where it will be marked as arriving. And I'm going to argue that the French Revolution gives, you, gives us a key to see this. And it's all about 1789. Is it Huey? Pardon me? Is it Huey? H-U-I? The... No, that's not the ones I remember. It's... Anyway, I, I, can, I can dig it out. It's not that important. The, um, it's, a weird, it's a weird name. Okay, so I'm going to put 1789 here. And this is the beginning of the French Revolution. And it goes until 1799. And what 1799 follow? 1798, you know, the, the deadly wound of the papacy. But notice this next quote. Feudalism abolished, 1789. One of the central events of the French Revolution was to abolish feudalism. The, and the old rules, taxes, and privileges left over from the age of feudalism. What's feudalism? It's where yeah. the, the landlords or the kings, they own everything, including the people. That's slavery. Yeah. Okay. The National Constituent Assembly, acting on the night of 4 August 1789, this is the beginning of the French Revolution, announced, the National Assembly abolishes the feudal system entirely. It abolished both this the seigneurial rights of the second estate. That's the, that's the monarchy, what we'd call the royalty here, the nobility. It abolished the right of kings to own people, okay, to own people. And ties gathered by the first estate, the Catholic clergy. So when they abolished feudalism, they abolished the ability of not only the monarchy to have slaves, but the Catholic Church to have slaves. I'm calling feudalism slaves at the prophetic level. The old judicial system founded on the 13 regional parliaments was suspended in November 1789 and finally abolished in 1790. So, what I'm saying is 1789, we're going to begin to see many prefer, prophetic characteristics. And one of them, I'm going to say is slavery. And I'm saying that is feudalism. In 1789, it's, it's done away with. But when 1789 gets repeated at the end of the world, I'm arguing that's going to mark where it returns. Okay. And... It was a strike against both the Catholic Church and the kings of Europe. So, go to Revelation 11, 1 through 13. I'm going to put this up here, 1798, 1799. I'm not arguing that historians end the French Revolution in 1799, but this way mark includes 1798. You'll see why. I'm going to take these two way marks. Um, this is the beginning of the United States. It's the beginning of the French Revolution. And I'm going to bring them down to the end of the United States and the end of the King of the South. Because right here, this is the arrival of the King of the South. Okay, so his beginning is going to illustrate his end. Um, and the beginning of the United States is going to illustrate their end. Because Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning. So we're going to put some characteristics to these dates. It's 10 years, um, would be a test. Revelation 13, or Revelation 11, 1 through 13. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein, and the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months 
and I will give power, and this is, this is where we're going to start focusing in, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. And just so you get my point, pull out of Revelation 11 now momentarily and go to the quote underneath the reference to Revelation 11 on page 4 of your notes from Testimonies, Volume 4, page 594. It says, Until Christ shall appear in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, men will become perverse in spirit and turn from truth to fables. The church will yet see troublous times. She will prophesy in sackcloth. So what I'm saying is when these two witnesses here in Revelation 9 are prophesying in sackcloth, Sister White is taking this passage of Revelation 11 and placing it at the end of the world. Okay, so we're, we're approaching it from that point of view. Um, but I want you to see another... She's going to place it specifically in a certain place, okay? But although she must meet heresies and persecutions, the church that's prophesying in sackcloth, although she must battle with the infidel and the apostate, yet by the help of God she is bruising the head of Satan. The Lord will have a people as true as steel and with faith as firm as, granite, as the granite rock. They are to be his witnesses in the world, his instrument, instrumentalities to do a special, glorious work in the day of his preparation." Okay, so she's saying we're going to do, if we're faithful, we're going to do a work of prophesying in sackcloth. And she says we're going to do it in the day of his preparation. And this movement has battled this argument over and over again about what the day of his preparation is. Uh, and it's simple for Adventists. It's, hard, it's amazing how people in this movement that are Adventists sometimes struggle with this concept. But... The day of the Lord is, is typically, we'd say, is the day that the Lord is going to punish the wicked. The seven last plagues is the day of the Lord at that level. At that level it is. But what is the day of the Lord at the more common level? Sabbath. Okay. So what is the day of the Lord's preparation at that level? It's the preparation day. It's the day before Sabbath. So in this message, in this movement, we have nailed down repeatedly when the day of the Lord's preparation began. When did the day of the Lord's preparation begin? At that level. There, and there's like, there's like four days, uh, and uh, generally when I say there's four days, I can only remember three of them. But there's four days that we bring together to show the, the, this particular day. One of them is called the Day of the East Wind. When does the Day of the East Wind begin? 9-11. Okay, so I'll leave it there. From 9-11 until the Sunday Law, you're in the Day of the Lord's Preparation. Therefore, in that time period, what are you doing? You're prophesying in sackcloth. Okay, and you are paralleling the history of the French Revolution and to apply it that way is to apply it just how Sister White applied it. So back to Revelation 11, verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of earth. And so it's talked about two witnesses in verse 3, two olive trees in verse 4, two candlesticks in verse 4. Uh, verse 5 says, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Uh, How does he get killed? From fire. Uh, but there's, there's three references there to these two witnesses. <coughs> and evidently, these two witnesses are going to come under attack, obviously. Not evidently, obviously. So what are the two witnesses? Sister White tells us what the two witnesses are directly. What are the two witnesses? Old and New Testament. Wrong. What are the two witnesses? <laughs> she says it's the Old and New Testament. Absolutely. But what is it in our history? Bible, Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. Okay. They're going to come under attack. And those people that throw out the thus saith the Lord, yes. fire is going to come down out of heaven and destroy them. That's what it says. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
These have power to shut up heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So now it's, it's using prophetic terminology to put labels on who these two witnesses are. Who's the witness that has the power to shut up heaven, that it rain not? Elijah. This is Elijah. And have power over the waters to turn them to blood. Who, which witness is that? Moses. Moses. Okay, so this is Moses and Elijah. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So if this is Moses and Elijah, and it is, if I'm going to teach that Moses was a failed prophet, that he was a racist and that he was a, a homophobic person, I better watch out because fire is going to come down out of heaven and consume me. All right? Just as stepping outside this study for a moment. Verse 7. And when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And in great controversy, who does the Sister White say this beast is? What's the, the philosophical label she puts upon them? Atheism. What would you say? Atheism. Yep. Yeah, okay, atheism. Um, and these atheistic ideas are disem disseminated by what? The French Revolution. They were part of the French Revolution, but how are they disseminated today? CNN, yeah. MSNBC, all the liberal presses, yeah. BBC, the, the United Nations. Okay. Um, and uh, verse 8 and their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified so their dead bodies are going to lie in France France is Sodom and Egypt Sister White comments on this saying this is atheistic France France is a two horned power Egypt and Sodom what is Sodom in the scriptures. Okay, not what I'm getting at. What, when, when Isaiah is condemning God's people, what does he call them? Sodom and, Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. So at that level, Sodom is a church. What is Egypt? It's Pharaoh. It's the government. It's church and state. The two horns for France at that level are church and state, Egypt and Sodom. And France typifies the United States. What are the two horns of the United States? Republicanism and, Republicanism and Protestantism. Church and state. Okay, so I want us to remember the connection between these two countries because the French Revolution that's beginning here in 1789, it's beginning with a constitution that is introduced in France called the Rights of Man. And it is not an accident that this is when our Constitution here in the United States goes into force in 1789. It can't be an accident. Verse, verse 9. The, there, these two witnesses are going to get killed in the streets of France. Okay, verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the graves, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because the two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life up from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And that same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. When was the earth? Where do we place this earthquake? When and where? The French Revolution. It's the French Revolution. This is the earthquake. What's a tenth part of the city represent? Tithe. Ten, a tenth is tithe, but in this passage, what's the ten, what's a city in Bible prophecy? A kingdom. A kingdom. What? You've already answered the question, and because you've answered it, it might be preventing you from thinking through about this thought that I'm bringing you. 
what city, what tenth part of the city is being discussed here? France. France. It's one tenth of what kingdom? The ten, the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome. Yeah. Uh, they're going to divide into ten kingdoms, these, these ten toes at that level. Um, and at this point, we're in a history where those pagan Rome's been one, one power. Now it's disintegrated Western Rome into ten nations. And now prophecy is emphasizing when paganism, the dragon power, migrates, if that's the way, right way to say it, from being a, a power that's in ten parts into one part. Okay? And the one part is, in Daniel 11, going to be called what? The king of the south. Yeah. This is the birth of the king of the south. A tenth part of the city suffers an earthquake. All right, And this earthquake is the French Revolution. It's this history here. This is the earthquake that's going to turn France upside down. Um, it's going to re remove feudalism, remove the monarchy, um, kick the Catholic Church out at least temporarily, deliver the deadly wound of the Catholic Church. And what I'm saying is, this history here is going to come into our history. And this is our history up here. And I'm saying we're going to have an earthquake. Is, do we not understand that the Constitution is going to be overthrown? Yeah. Okay, that's the earthquake. Is there going to be a revolution such as a civil war? Yes, okay. Um, so, moving on to our notes now. An earthquake, the subtitle. Yes. What does the three and a half mean in nine and in eleven? What typically what I would do on Revelation eleven is I'll show that these two witnesses are a parallel line to Christ, but it's an established teaching in this movement. So I, I wasn't going to take time for it, but you can show that in the time of Christ he was born 4 BC and when he was 30 years old he was baptized okay um, and the dove comes down and he gives his testimony for three and a half years and at the end of three and a half years he's crucified and then he's buried resurrected and then he ascends okay this is his ascension. So we use this as the, it's called the pattern of Christ, to show that the pattern of Antichrist is governed by this pattern. Because Antichrist, the papacy, first paganism is taken out of the way, then 30 years later, in 538, the papacy is empowered, just like Christ was. And it gives its satanic testimony for three and a half prophetic years, just like Christ gave its godly, his godly testimony for three and a half literal years. And at the end of the 1260, in 1798, the papacy receives its deadly wound. Okay, right where Christ received his deadly wound. But then the papacy is forgotten. The days of one king. Isaiah 23, it's forgotten until the Sunday law. So it, you, you just got to forget this. But, but in this history, the papacy will be resurrected and then ascend to the throne of the earth, just like Jesus was resurrected and ascend, ascended. But this period of time here with the papacy, there's a break in it. The Bible identifies this break. But when we're teaching this, because something is established upon the testimony of two or three, we identify that the two witnesses are the Bible, the Word of God, and Christ is the Word of God. So, this being the, the Old and New Testament in the French Revolution time period, how long does it say that they're going to give their testimony for? For three and a half years. And then they're going to be killed, and they're going to stay in the streets for three and a half days. Then they're going to be resurrected, brought back to life, and then they're going to ascend to heaven. So we, we show that Revelation 11 is governed by the history of Christ to the very letter, 
So is Antichrist. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that. The three and a halfs are, are self-evident, if that's the right way to say it. Let me take up the subject of the earthquake, though, of the French Revolution. This is from Great Controversy 286. When France publicly rejected God and set aside the Bible, wicked men and spirits of darkness exalted in their attainment of the object so long desired, a kingdom free from the restraints of God, the law of God. Because sentence against an evil work was not speedily executed, therefore the hearts of the sons of men was fully set in them to do evil. Ecclesiastes 8.11 but the transgression of the just and the righteous law must inevitably, inevitably result in misery and ruin. And you'll notice I have this underlined because what I'm wanting you to watch for now is that France was given a period of time and she did, never took advantage of the period of time to repent for her rejection of the law of God, as is the United States. So when the French Revolution hits, it's because the Lord has given them a period of time that they don't take advantage of. Same with the United States. The United States has filled up the cup, okay? Though so not visited at once with judgments, the wickedness of men was nevertheless surely working out their doom. Centuries of apostasy and crime had been treasuring up wrath against the day of retribution. And when their iniquity was full, there's their full cup, the despisers of God learned too late that it is a fearful thing to have worn out the divine patience. The restraining spirit of God, which imposes a check upon the cruel power of Satan, was in a great measure removed, and he whose only delight is in the wretchedness of men was permitted to work his will. Those who had chosen the service of rebellion were left to reap its fruit until the land was filled with crimes too horrible for pen to trace. From devastated provinces and ruined cities, a terrible cry was heard, a cry of bitter anguish. France was shaken as if by an earthquake. Okay, I want to mark the earthquake. Religion, law, social order, the family, the state, and the church were all were smitten down by the impious hand that had been lifted against the law of God. Truly spoke the wise men, the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him, but it shall not be well with the wicked. They hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, therefore they, they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Okay, so the discussion that keeps coming up around here is uh, 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 from time to time, you know, is this pandemic man-made or whatever? The, whether the virus is man-made or whether it's not man-made, but men are taking advantage of it to accomplish the goals of globalism. This is speaking to the principle that it doesn't really matter. Uh, they're, even if they're the ones that open Pandora's box, the results of this pandemic and, and all the things it's going to bring about is going to turn it upside down on them. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bring judgment upon them. It's, it isn't anything that they can control. Um, even if they had a part to play in, in, in starting it, thinking they could control it. Next paragraph. God's faithful witnesses slain by the blasphemous power that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit were not long to remain silent. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. It was in, 18, in 1793 that the decrees which abolished the Christian religion and set aside the Bible passed the French assembly. Three and a half years later, a resolution rescinding these, decree, these decrees, thus granting toleration to the scriptures, was adopted by the same body. 
The world stood aghast at the enormity of guilt which had resulted from a rejection of the sacred oracles, and men recognized the necessity of faith in God and his word as the foundation of virtue and morality. Saith the Lord, whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed, and against whom hast thou exalted thy voice, and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? Therefore, behold, I will cause them to know, this once will I cause them to know my hand and my might, that they might know my name is Jehovah. So here, Sister White is identifying a time period from 1793 to 1796 as your 3.5 years, Clayton. Okay. So we want to look at what happened in 1793 and 1796. Okay. And you see underneath that quote, the reign of terror, okay? And you'll notice the dates there. Robespierre set up in power July 27, 1793. One year later, Robespierre falls July 27, 1794. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? Oh, July, 27th. July 27th, okay, when it comes to this activity of Robespierre, uh, or what I'm going to call the reign of terror, all right, S Sister White's going to, and historians are going to say this three and a half years is the reign of terror, uh, and so be it, okay, if that's the reign of terror, I'm not arguing it, but I'm saying the first year is the reign of terror the same way the first angel's message possesses all the characteristics of the first, second, and third in it. This yeah, first... Th said that it was longer, and you were saying it was just one year. Yeah, it's just one, it's, it's one year based upon the prophetic light that we're given. It begins on July 27th, 1793, when Robespierre becomes a dictator, and it ends... The, the real bloodbath ends one year later when Robespierre is executed. Okay, so here he becomes a dictator. Here he dies. But of course, what am I getting at? What's my punchline in all this? This here. It's July 27th, both places. And what's July 27th? July 18th. Okay, this is this is a a prophetic symbol. Okay, now so I'll tell you where I'm going. Where I'm going here is I'm saying this history here, which is the 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 real essence of the reign of terror, that that this is this history. That this is July 27th, 1793. And this is July 27th, 1794. And that in this history, we're going to have an earthquake in darkness. All right. Let's see if I can bring that out. You'll notice that where Sister White ends this period in 1796, what Napoleon does at this point is he goes to war with Italy. He goes to war with Italy. All right. In in the history of 1793 to 1796, which probably Sister White and historians would argue that this three and a half years is the reign of terror. And what I'm telling you is I don't have a problem with it being the reign of terror, but the real reign of terror is this year here where the bloodbath was taking place. What starts this this history of 17? Is this a three? It doesn't look like a three. The history of 1793. One of the things that started it, it starts it is something happens to the king of France. What happens to him in 1793? 
he loses his head, okay? The, the, the royalty is, go the monarchy is gone. His head's gone. Now you have a dictator. Monarchy's gone. You're moving into a bloodbath, uh, just an ebb and flow bloodbath that ends with the dictator dying. Okay, so I'm saying that this is where Trump becomes a dictator. Yes, 1793, and over here Trump dies. Now I'm not suggesting that necessarily that he dies. He changes roles from the President of the United States to the President of the United Nations. Pardon me? But he could die. He could die. Yeah. Why could he die? Because that's what it represents. Because that's one witness that it that it that he that it, he could die. What's another one? He's getting old. He's getting old, but that's not a prophetic witness. Uh, okay, Methuselah lived a lot longer than yeah, in his seventies. What's another prophetic witness that he could die? What what president is he? He's the forty fifth. But what Republican president is he? The last. He's okay. He'd be the last, but he's the. He's the, he, George Washington wasn't a Republican. Who was the first Republican president? Lincoln. 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 And it makes Trump the 19th Republican president, right? Okay, but the first Republican president is going to typify the last Republican president. And the first Republican president, what happened to him? At, at the end of what? Civil War. Uh, at the end of a civil war. He gets assassinated. By who? The Jesuits, the Catholic Church, okay, at the end of a civil war. And so this earthquake may very well be that civil war being repeated. So Trump could physically die. You've got prophetic evidence there. But it could be just that we know that this is the end of the United States. Because what is this? What is this when the Catholic Church executes the United States? This is the Sunday law. Yeah. This is the Sunday law. So Trump doesn't have to physically die, but he could. He could. But he could. W what if he did? Then, he, then all this would be wrong because he, he wouldn't be the last Republican president because then Pence would be. But Pence would not be the president of the United States. He'd be the last president of the United States, perhaps. But if Pence comes in here when the United States has been become part of the United Nations, I kind of like it if he did in terms of October 22nd, 1844. Why? October 22nd, 1844 typifies the Sunday Law. And that history of the Millerites was from 1798 to 1844. How many years is that? 46. And what president would Pence be? The 46th. And if he came in right here, when would he come in? Right when the door closed on the United States. So he really wouldn't be the last president of the United States. He'd be the first president of the United Nations in the threefold union. But I'm not going there. I'm just talking out loud. I'll get myself in trouble uh, by doing this. I, this is not in the notes. You'll see. Okay, so I, what I want you to see, this history here that Sister White refers to, this history up here, 1793 to 1796, is the War of the Vendees in the French Revolution. The War of the Vendee, 1793 to 96, counter-revolutionary insurrections in the west of France during the French Revolution. And I'll just tell you what it is. The Vendees in, in Western France, what were they? Number one, they'll say they were the poor uneducated. They weren't too smart. Uh, but what were they more than not being too smart, according to the historical re re record? Not too well educated. They were pro-Catholic. They were against the Catholic Church being rejected in the French Revolution. They were fighting for the Catholics. And Napoleon's going to go and he's going to clean house on them during these years, okay? The first, and most, the first and most important occurred in 1793 in the area known as the Vendee. 
which included large sections of the departments of Lower Inferior, Monte Lower, Du Save. We should be having Daniel try to pronounce these, and the Vendee proper. In this f fervently religious and economically backward re region, the revolution of 1789 was received with little enthusiasm and only a few minor disturbances. The first signs of real discontent appeared with the government's enactment of the civil constitution of the clergy, July 1790, in instituting strict controls over the Roman Catholic Church. A general uprising began with the in introduction of the Conscription Acts of February 1793. On March 4th, rioting commenced at Cholet, and by the 13th, the Vendi was in open revolt. So during this history, Napoleon's dealing with Catholic zealots in France. And he finally puts them down here at the end of this period of time. Uh, so what's going on in this history? Is he fighting with Italians or is he fighting with British? He's fighting with French. Who is Napoleon? He's French. This history is a civil war. Okay, so this history here, 1793, 1796, I think you can probably put it here as well. You follow me? Civil War, being illustrated. But I'm saying the very beginning of this history, that first year, down here, it's giving us a connection somehow, some way, to Islam. I'm going to read a couple more things. I, 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 I actually thought we would get through these notes. Unhappy France, the very spot. I want you to see that this French Revolution was governed by prophecy. Unhappy France reaped in blood the harvest she had sown. Terrible were the results of her submission to the controlling power of Rome. <laughs> where France, under the influence of Romanism, had set up the first stake at the opening of the Reformation. There, the revolution set up its first guillotine. And here's what I want to remind you of now. I'm claiming, and I don't know that anyone else claims this, but I'm, I still know that I'm correct on this. I'm sorry, but I do. France typifies the United States. France was chosen by God to be the glorious land of Europe. And they rejected that high calling. And in so doing, they give a demonstration to the end of the United States when the United States rejects that high calling. So as prophecy traces the story of France in the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, it's going to tell you, tell us that they be where they began to resist the light of Protestantism, and the very first Protestant martyr dies at the same place on the same day of the year, 258 years before the King of France dies in the same place on the same day of the year by losing his head to begin the French Revolution. There's no way that that's not prophetic. And it's speaking to, to, to many things. One, that, that God had called France to be the champion of the Protestant Reformation and she rejected her high calling just as the United States has done. They're parallel, parallel symbols. Okay, so where France under the influence of Romanism had set up the first stake at the opening of the Reformation, there, the revolution set up its first guillotine on the very spot where the first martyrs to the Protestant faith were burned in the 16th century, the first victims were guillotined in the 18th. In repelling the gospel which would have brought her healing, France had opened the door to infidelity and ruin. That's the same testimony of the United States. When we throw out the light that was given to us, Constitution. The, the Constitution, and our responsibility to be the great defender of religious liberty, then we bring this darkness upon ourselves. 
When the restraints of God's law were cast aside, it was found that the laws of man were inadequate to hold in check the powerful tides of human passion, and the nation swept on to revolt and anarchy. The war against the Bible inaugurated an era which stands in the world's history as the reign of terror. Peace and happiness were banished from the homes of heart and hearts of men. No one was secure. He who triumphed today was suspected, condemned tomorrow. Violence and lust held undisputed sway. Uh, something just popped into my mind about the governor of California and this pandemic. When I went to Australia, the guy that invited us, the first time I went to Australia, the guy that invited us to speak down there, he took us around Australia. And he was really anti-Jesuit. And he, I, heard, I learned lots of things about the Jesuits from this guy. But one of the things that frustrated him about Australia is in, this is 15, 20 years ago, Australia had just implemented a program and he explained to me why it was a Jesuit program. And it was. It was it's turning the citizens against one another. And in Australia, if you wish to, you can make a living. I don't know if you can make a living, but you can make money off of it. You can buy yourself a radar gun with a camera, and you can go set on on the highway, and you can record your neighbors driving over the speed limit, and if you can get a picture of them and the radar gun, gun stamping that they're going over the speed limit, then you take that in, and they have to pay a fine, and you get a cut of it. So this guy, he hated it. He, as we were driving across Australia, he hated the idea that he couldn't go above the speed limit and that there was just regular citizens out there with radar guns to bust you, okay? Th this guy in California, the governor of California, Newsom, within the past 48 hours, He's calling on the citizens of California to start turning in their neighbors that aren't obeying the house restrictions. You know the first person who actually did that, though, after he said that? No. Schwarzenegger's wife went out and out of a farmer's Schreiber. market and closed down a farmer's market by reporting them. Wow. Okay, so Shriver, she's a, Shriver. yeah, she's a liberal. Yeah, uh, she's, she's, a she's of the Kennedy family. Yeah, she's the first one to do it. That's Jesuit. Okay, to turn the citizens yeah. against each other. Okay, uh, I really got off track there, but I got to read this. I have to read this next paragraph because it goes with this previous paragraph. They're starting to do the same thing in Tennessee. Yeah, this is. This is, this is the activities that lead to this situation in France. You start turning citizens against one another. Great Controversy 230. The gospel of peace which France had rejected was to, was to be only too surely rooted out and terrible would be the results. On the 21st of January, 1793, 258 years from the very day that fully committed France to the persecution of the reformers, another procession with a far different purpose passed through the streets of Paris. And the king was the chief figure. Again there were tumult and shouting. Again there was heard the cry for more victims. Again there were black scaffolds. And again the scenes of the day were closed by horrid executions. Louis XVI, struggling hand-to-hand -hand with his jailers and executioners, was dragged forward to the block and there held down by main force till the axe had fallen and his dissevered head fell on the scaffold. Nor was the king the only victim. Near the same spot, 2,800 human beings perished by the guillotine during the bloody days of the Reign of Terror. That's this one here on the bottom that I'm pointing out, that begins in 1793. Because the king's gone, now Robespierre is going to take control. And he's going to be a dictator for a year. But this begins with a king, a monarchy being removed. Okay, Slavery being done away with, feudalism, monarchy being removed, Catholic Church shut down, blood spilling, and in one year, Robespierre is going to have the same thing turned upon his head. But the idea that the first Protestant martyr in France was executed on January 21st, 250 year, 58 years before the king was, that's prophetic. There's, there's no way that that's a coincidence. That's prophetic. Um, 
The Reformation had presented to the world an open Bible, unsealing the precepts of the law of God and urging its claims upon the consciences of people. Infinite love had unfolded to men the statutes and principles of heaven, and God and had God had said, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Deuteronomy 46, 4, 6. When France rejected the gift of heaven, she sowed the seeds of anarchy and ruin, and the inevitable outworking of cause and effect resulted in the revolution and the reign of terror. So when we come back tomorrow, what I, I want to put in place here is I'm going to argue that 1798 um, is going to get plugged in right here, okay, along with 1793, that these are fractals in the French Revolution, along, uh, and that down here you can put in 1794, the end of this year, or you could put 1796 when the Italian War begins, or you can put 1798. I'm going to put all three of them up there and try to show from here to here that we have darkness in the land. And when do we have darkness in the land? We have darkness in the land between the 6th and the ninth hour. Right? And, and this is the history of the midnight cry to the Sunday law, and that here you have an earthquake in terms of the, the overthrow of the United States. And the United States, in this prophetic scenario, is going to become one-tenth of the Ten Kings. The earthquake of the French Revolution, France was one-tenth of the Ten Kings, and it suffered the earthquake. The United States is going to be one-tenth of the Ten Kings. It's going to suffer the earthquake. But what I really want you to see, if you will, is when you take these three lines of the French Revolution and bring them in here, what, I, what I'm hoping you can see, is that you can put July 27th here and July 27th here, which means you are marking Islam at the midnight cry and Islam down here at the Sunday Law. It's a witness to Islam. And we got more to say about July 27th and 1789 because what happens on July 27th or what? 1789. This is July 27, 1793 and 1794. What happened on July 27, 1789? Well, in 1789 you have the Constitution of France and the Constitution of the United States. But on July 27, 1798, 1789, You have the, the beginning of the State Department in the United States. Okay. And what is that? This being 7 27 1789. And Ju July 27th is a, a symbol of what? Islam, is it not? Okay, where do we see this symbol of Islam repeatedly? Where do we see it? In Revelation 9, don't we? In the story of the first and second woe. Where do we first see it in the story of the Revelation 9? Don't we see it 727, 1299? Isn't that right? So from 1299 to 1789 is what? Four hundred and ninety years to the very letter. And what's four hundred and ninety years? It's probationary time. Okay, so Islam is connected to this, 1789. All right. So we have France connected to this. France. Yes. Yes. Everyone with me? And France here is atheism. It's the dragon. Do we have the United States? 
USA? Yeah, this is when their constitution was. What are they? No, they're not the false prophet. Oh, were, was the United States the false prophet in 1789? No, it was the lamb. The lamb like what? Beast. Uh, okay, it's the beast. What else do we have connected here? We have Islam. Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning. We have Islam. Don't we? Yes. And what's Islam now, Sister Kathy? The it, it's the false prophet. <laughs> Got a threefold union here. Threefold union here. There'll be a threefold union here. And what I'm getting at, if I've lost my audience as I bring this to a conclusion, this history here is the history of France, among other things. And France is the beginning of the King of the South, and therefore it's identifying the end of the King of the South. And the King of the South comes to his end when it is Russia. This is the end of Russia, among other things. Not just the Civil War and the darkness in the United States. Shall we pray? Did you, did you, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, I know, I know the connection from the other presentations on July 31 equaling July 18th, but I don't remember July 27 equal July 18th. Why does July 27 equal July 18th? I remember the 31, but I don't remember 27. It's it, it based upon what Larry said. July 27th is, with. if you just take July 27th, in Revelation 9, it'll occur five times, okay, in 1299, 1449, and then there's three other occurrences that I don't know off the top of my head that we put on the board here. Okay, so July 27th is always popping up in Revelation 9, and it's profound that it pops up, but July 27th is also what on the biblical calendar? It's the 26th day of the fourth month, and July 18th is also the 26th day of the fourth month. So what you, what you have is you, you establish July 27th on, in Revelation 9 on five witnesses is also the 26th day of the fourth month. And the mathematical possibility of that happening, it's, it, there is no mathematical possibility of that happening. But when you take Revelation 9 and you extend it out to July 18th, you, you, sh you show that the 26th day of the fourth month is also July 18th. Okay, so they come together in that, in that sense. That's how they come together. So what I'm saying is when you're talking about the French Revolution and you have Robespierre becoming a dictator on July 27th and exactly one year later he dies in this revolution and it's July 27th and you have this date here going 490 years, marking the beginning of the State Department. And this date here, what this is known for, this is Ottman. And what Ottman did in this history is he brought together the government, the Muslim governments, with the religion. They had never been that way before. That was his contribution. And the formation of the State Department, that's the first, that's the leading government office of a government. So you can see the, the work of Ottman bringing church to state together is connecting with the State Department down here. This is a probationary time saying that this history here, 1789, if we're going to bring it over here, and we are, it's talking about the close of probation for the, for the United States in this history. Shall we pray? Yep. Does anyone there have a question or a comment. Uh, we're, not, we're learning how to use this just like you are. And it's hard for us that are speaking not to give you time to ask because there's a, there's a lag time. I'll give you time if you have any comments or questions. We would love to hear from you. Hello? Hello? Thank you for providing this service. Okay. See you tomorrow, Lord willing. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as we take up...
today's task, we ask that you would allow us to internalize these prophetic truths in our minds that we can start bringing them together to recognize the consistency of your word and the, the clarity that you're bringing into our history that we can see the coming way marks, know what to expect and better be prepared not only in our own lives but better prepared to give a message. We ask a blessing upon our day's service, whatever we're doing for you. We ask a blessing upon the work of transmitting this message um, and we thank you for allowing us to be involved with this, this work and this message in Jesus' name. Amen.